Uh, Revelation chapter 10, if you would, please. Let's move on from that story. Let's forget about it. Leaving those things that are behind, let us press toward the mark. Uh, and then Thursday afternoon, um, I had my back to a uh, thicket. And sure enough, uh, this, this buck, he was not in any hurry whatsoever. He was not alerted to my presence. He was probably 15 yards away from my deer blind, and he had no clue that I was in there. And he walked up behind me, just very slow walk, all, just barely making any noise. I thought it was a squirrel at first. And uh, I turned around like this and looked. I could see his head down, and uh, he was rooting around, I guess, for acorns or whatever, and never knew that I was there, and what I should have done was I should have let him walk past me, and I could have got a better shot of him, but anyway, I, I stood up out of that chair to turn around, and he heard me, and so he just kind of trotted back into the thicket from where he came from. Well, Lindsay was hunting up that way. So I sent her a text and I said, there's a, at least an eight to 10 point buck headed your way. She never saw him, but we think that's the buck that lives sort of in that area because yesterday, let's see, yesterday morning? No, um, Friday morning, going out to my stand, no sooner than I crossed that fence, I got 10 paces the other side of that fence. Whoosh, 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 there he goes, running through woods snorting and uh alerting everybody to my presence there and i didn't see him after that that's my dear story that's all i've got all i've got all right revelation chapter 10 um one thing i believe for sure when we all get to heaven uh, we can get unlimited deer amen unlimited who in here likes deer meat oh yeah i do i love it i love it um we had a, we had a guy out at richwoods and he was a man his wife and kids came to church faithfully and every preacher that was there before me had went to try to witness to him to try to talk him into coming to church or you know giving his life to the lord or whatever and he wouldn't budge. He just would. He was a good guy. Good guy. Wouldn't budge. He would not give himself over to the gospel for nothing. And we had been there like three years. The third year we were there. Uh, he took a hunting trip to Colorado and killed a big old mule deer. Well, when he came back, just out of the blue... Um, he comes to church one Sunday and after church, he hands me a package and I said, what is this? He said, you'll see when you open it up. When I got home, I opened it up. It was a package of the back strap from this mule deer. The best eaten on a deer that there is. And I'm going, now why did he do that? And, um, it wasn't maybe two or three weeks later that he came forward at the end of my preaching and gave his life to the Lord. I guess God a bit, what? Our daughter is stranded at home. She can't get her truck started. All right, anyway. Uh, enough dear story. Revelation 10. I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven. This is, I believe, the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to find that out uh, as we move along. He's coming down from heaven. That's first clue. Number two is clothed with a cloud. Uh, that is, uh, I believe, a major clue to his identification uh, a rainbow was upon his head again a major indication that this must be none other than 
the glorified Son of God, the same one who's sitting on the throne in Ezekiel chapter 1, um, where Ezekiel, when he saw one like unto the Son of Man sitting on a throne, and um, there was a rainbow about that throne. Um, so he has a rainbow upon his head. His face was, as it were, the sun. So again, another major clue. Christ said, I am the light of the world. In Matthew 17, when Jesus went on to the Mount of Transfiguration, the Bible says that his countenance, his face was changed. And it shone so bright that the other disciples could not look upon him uh, because of the brightness of his face. We have a typology of that in the form of Moses. When he comes down from Mount Sinai the second time, the Bible says that his face shone as the brightness of the sun. And it was so bright that the Israelites said, we can't, we can't look at him. And so they asked for a veil to be put over Moses' face. And Paul talks about that and he says every time that the Jew reads the Old Testament because they don't understand it, they don't understand who that is there, that the veil is over their eyes every time they read it and they just don't understand it. If one of these days, I believe the veil is going to be lifted from off their eyes. Like uh, Paul, when Paul uh, met Jesus on the Damascus Road after they be, they uh, had finished their conversation and Paul is going on to Damascus. What's wrong with his eyes? He's blind. And so when um, he's uh, when he's baptized, what happens then to his eyes? It was as if scales had were coming off. OK, so you could think of that as a being like a, a picture of Israel. Is that one of these days the, the, the uh, veil is going to come off like the scales over Paul's eyes. And they're going to be able to see now for the very first time that Jesus Christ is in fact their Messiah. So his face was as it were the sun. Malachi chapter uh, 4 said, uh, calls God the son of righteousness. S-U-N of righteousness. Um, Revelation or excuse me Psalm 19 uh, depicts. Uh, the heavens declaring the glory of God, the firmament showeth his handiwork. And the Bible says that the, the heavens are like a tabernacle for the sun. And the sun goes through that tabernacle like a bridegroom coming out of his closet. And of course, the bridegroom is Christ. So we have all these indicators that Christ is related to the sun that you and I see over there, he's the greater light that rules over the day. He's not the lesser light that rules over the night. So we have that. We have his feet as pillars of fire. We talked about that. How Israel of old was led through the wilderness with one pillar of fire at night. Now these people are going to be led to the promised land by two pillars of fire which are, it represents uh, Jesus Christ and so on. And then the Bible says he had in his hand a little book open. Let me get to my notes here on this one. Here we go. Um, tell you what I want you to do. Uh, let me read these verses here. In verse 2, he had in his hand a little book open. And he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot on the earth. Now, if, let's go back to uh, Revelation chapter 3, because that to me is relevant to, to the application of who this angel is. Revelation chapter 3. In verse 7... Um, this is to the uh, angel, the, the messenger of the church in Philadelphia. That's not Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. That's uh, Philadelphia where? Where would that have been? Greece, maybe. But anyway, um, yeah, philos and uh, adelphon are Greek words. Philadelphia. These things uh, uh, saith he that is holy, 
He that is true and the he that hath the key of David. In verse 7 he says, He that openeth and no man shutteth. And shutteth and no man openeth. So, um, think of a story where you have something being shut and if it was shut by God, that means only God can open it back up again. Okay, good one. The ark. The tomb. Very good. Huh? The gates of hell. Yeah. Um, in the case of Noah's ark, Noah did not shut the doors of the ark. And you'll see that on the internet. If you see stories and stuff about written about Noah and the, the true secret behind Noah, that I, I hate these things. Um, they'll have Noah closing the ark. Noah didn't close the ark. God told him to get inside. And he said, for yet seven days and I'll destroy everything, you know, that is. And so Noah and his family went on the ark right then and they waited seven days. And sure enough, seven days later, God himself closed the door to the ark. Now it's shut. And because God closed it, not even Noah can open it back up. Now, at the end of everything, when uh, the ark is resting and the vegetation has returned on the earth and you have animals now and so on. Noah comes off of the ark because God had opened the door for him. And Noah gets to come off the ark. Uh, who else? Who did you mention, Gary? Daniel in the lion's den. Uh, you have an illustration of that because the, ki the king uh, that uh, sentenced Daniel to, to be punished by being put into the lion's den... Uh, that was his big mistake. When he wrote this law, he should have said that the prisoner must remain in there until eaten by the lions. But that's not what he put in there. He just said that he shall be put into the lion's den and the door locked. Didn't say he had to die. So the next morning, the king goes out there, Daniel, oh Daniel! And he looks down in there and Daniel's sitting there and he's petting lions. Yeah, he shut the lion's mouth. They weren't going to open. Uh, but only the king, it was called the law of the Medes and Persians, that if a king signed a decree and sealed it with his ring signet, not even he could break that law. And so the king knew that he could not break that law. So anyway... Uh, he couldn't open it back up except it fulfilled the, the, the commandment that he gave forth. But anyway, you get the idea here that Christ is the one who opens and no man shuts. He shuts and no man opens. And so now we have uh, this book in um, Revelation uh, 10. And we have a mention of it, of the law here in Revelation 3. These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David... He that openeth and no man shutteth and shutteth and no man openeth. And it also applies to this particular book as well. So turn to Revelation 5. And I know we've already uh, covered this, but it brings up uh, part of my favorite teaching in the whole world. And that is a study of the book. In Revelation chapter 5, now, uh, we're already in Revelation 10, which means that time has expired between Revelation 5 and Revelation 10. And so here this mighty angel, clothed with a cloud, rainbows over his head, his face shining as it were the sun, um, his feet, he has one foot on the earth, one foot on the sea, he has dominion over everything in the world, so on and so on and so on. I believe this to be Jesus Christ. And to me, the book seals it. The book uh, being opened in his hand 
indicates to me that this is indeed Christ. So in Revelation chapter 5, verse 1, And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. Why do you think it's so important that he mentioned that it was the right hand? Why do you think that's important? Yes, sir. Okay, that's a good one. That's a good one. Okay, now let me ask you this one. Why is Jesus sitting on the right hand of God and not the left hand? Or like in the middle on his lap? Or at his feet? Do what? It is a place of power. Okay. Um, nature itself teaches us this. We have, a, we have a hand of strength. We have a hand of weakness. Okay. Now, if you're left-handed, you still have a hand of strength. It's your left hand. You have a hand of weakness. It's your right hand. And there are things that your left hand, if you're your weak hand, there are things your weak hand cannot do that your strong hand can do. Okay. And so it's that way with the Bible. We have a new covenant here delivered to us, brought down to man, not by Moses, but by Jesus himself. And that covenant that we call the New Testament, the new covenant, so on and so on. Uh, the new law, as it were, um, that covenant has way more power in it than the old covenant does. And if you take note here, which one of these is bigger? The Old Testament. It's bigger. It's got more stuff in it. It's got more words in it. It's got more stories in it. It's got more prophecies in it. It's got more laws in it. It's got everything in it. In abundance. But this poor, measly little New Testament just doesn't have anything in it. Hardly. It has Jesus in it. There you go. It doesn't have Moses, who is a stand-in for Jesus. Uh, you know, do you know what an understudy is? What's an understudy? Very good. Guy who's playing your part behind the scenes so that if something happens to you, he can step in and fill in your shoes one night and play your part. Okay. Um, Singing groups um, like Gold City or the cathedrals or whatever. Greater Vision, I know, did this. Um, Greater Vision had a guy that was their bus driver that was a very, very good piano player. He was a very gifted singer and so on. So his role was double. Number one, he drove their bus for them everywhere they went. And number two, if one of the guys ended up sick or whatever, couldn't couldn't perform that night, then their bus driver stepped in and did it for him. Makes, makes a lot of sense, okay? Um, where was it going with that? That was good. At least you learned something about what an understudy is. Anyway. Um, I can't remember what I was saying. But anyway, right hand, left hand. That helps. Okay. All right, so the right hand's the right hand of power. So in Revelation 5, we have in the right hand of God, and you're right, Jesus also sits at the right hand of the Father. Uh, that is the place of intercession. That is the place where um, uh, Christ is our uh, advocate with the Father, which means he's our lawyer. He is our defense attorney. Christ is there to relay to the Father what he can relate to the Father, but we can't because we don't know all the law. We don't know how things are really done, but Christ does. And so he is there for us in our place uh, in the courtroom of God. 
So he, I, you what? Amen to that. I need a good lawyer. Amen. Uh, him that sat on the throne, a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the what? The book. And to lose the seals thereof. And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Why seven seals? Why were there seven? Huh? Completeness, yeah. How many spirits? Seven. The seven spirits of God. And so this was sealed by, same way we are, sealed by the Holy Spirit. And who has the right to seal or unseal? It's Jesus Christ. Who is it? That guarantees your salvation. Is it the Pope? <laughs> I thought that was funny. I said the Pope and y'all said nope. Nope to a Pope on a rope. Amen. Pope soap on a rope. <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah. Where was I going with that one now? Anyway. <laughs> No one, no one can steal your salvation, take your salvation away. No one can do that. They don't have the power to it. They don't have the ability to do it. Um, so anyway, in verse 4, I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and read the book, neither to look thereon. One of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah... The root of David hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Now, um, I want you to get your Bibles out. And I want you to follow with me on something here. Let me um, get my Bible search software going here. This is what ended up being one of my favorite word studies that I've ever done in the Bible. Um, this absolutely knocked my socks off when I saw it. The word book or books, it only comes in two forms. It's mentioned 196 times in the Bible. Now, if you were to do the math on that, that is, um, s let's see here, 7 times 7, which is 49. It ends up being 49 times 4. Okay? 7 times 7. 7 is the number of perfection. 4 represents the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Okay, 196 times. Now, I'm going to type in another word. Uh, son of man. What's wrong here? That should be coming up 196 times. Why isn't it? Son of man. Hmm. Let's see. Oh, that's why. That's why. Case sensitive. Here we go. Son of man, which was the name Christ used for himself most often, 196 times. Seven times seven times four. Exact same amount of times. Then, 
Jesus Christ. Ron and Sandy wanted to get here before the electricity kicked off. <laughs> Jesus Christ, 196 times exactly. So you have the word book. You have son of man. You have Jesus Christ. And all of them are a reference to the same thing. Christ is the word of God. He is the Son of Man, and He is Jesus. And the word Christ is the Greek version of the Hebrew word Messiah, which means the anointed. So we have Jesus Christ 196 times, Son of Man 196 times, book or books 196 times exactly in this one book. Man did not put that there. Man could not have manipulated the text of the Bible in order to put that there and to make it come out exactly right. I'll give you another one. Since we're dealing with this number. Word of God. 49 times. What does that break down to be? Seven times seven. And is the word of God perfect? Is it complete? Amen. How about, I'll give you another one. God's title of most high. 49 times, seven times seven. And that's something that all that shows up in this one book. Now, I've given you facts. Those facts are um, undisputable or indisputable. They are undeniable. I'm not manipulating numbers. I'm not manipulating the text. I'm not uh, trying to pull the wool over your eyes, make you see something that isn't really there. I'm just giving you facts. What you do with those facts. Is... Yes, sir. Jesus Christ is all in the New Testament. Son of Man is divided up. 88 occurrences uh, refer to Christ in the New Testament. The rest of them refer to Ezekiel in the book of Ezekiel and a couple other places, I think, in the Psalms. Ezekiel was always called Son of Man, Son of Man, Son of Man, Son of Man. So was Jesus. Um, let me give you one more thing. Uh, this software that we have here I'm going to have it go to the 490th chapter of the Bible. That would be what? 49 times 10? Correct? Those of you who still know how to do math. 490th chapter of the Bible. So let's break that down. That is 70 times 7. Right? And it's Psalm 12. And you know what Psalm 12 says? It says in verse 6, The words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. And God put that in the 490th chapter of the Bible, 70 times 7. I'm going to give you one more. And then after that, I'll give you one more. Exodus. Turn to Exodus. This would be easy for you to do. This is going to be the 70th chapter of the Bible. 70 for God's word of perfection. Uh, 7 for God's perfection. And 10... For God's dominion. I'm going to have you turn to Exodus 20. That is the 70th chapter of the Bible. And I'm going to underline all the words of the first verse. And it says, And God spake all these words, saying. Seven words. 
Who said these words? Did God say most of these words? Did he say half of them? All of them. And then what follows after that verse? Verse 1. I am the Lord thy God which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Um, the Ten Commandments. The very first recording of the words of the Ten Commandments are found in the 70th chapter of your Bible. And people want to say that God had nothing to do with that whatsoever. I tend to disagree. In fact, I wholeheartedly disagree with that. Amen? I think God had everything to do with that. Amen. Amen. All right. Father, we ask your blessings on your word this morning. I pray, dear God, Lord, that you would enlighten our hearts and our souls and our minds. Lord, teach us great and mighty things that we know not. Prepare us for days that are coming. And Father, on this Thanksgiving Sunday, Lord, we offer up our praise, our love, our adoration of you. We thank you, God, for feeding us, for clothing us, for giving us such health as we have. Father, we just thank you for all of it. You're a good God to us. And Lord, just open up your word and Father, take... What's been shown to these people, Lord, is show them far greater things than I ever could see. Lord, just bless your word today, we pray in Jesus' name. And amen. Amen. amen.